Woi woi, woi woi, woi woi. Then the dank up on the radio again. Yo! If you wanna smoke free weed, go board yourself. You need to go plant a seed. Go board yourself. Make your knowledge increase. Go board yourself. Go board yourself. Hey, all right. Welcome to episode number 25 of Grow Bud Yourself. We've got a great show for you guys today. Uh, Dr. Mitch Earlywine is back. Our guest is Chanel Lindsay of Ardent Cannabis and a great cultivation segment as well. Harvesting timeline, questions and answers, all kinds of good stuff. So stick around. Episode 25 coming at you. All right, welcome back, and as always, thank you to DJ Jacques and Winstrong. This is episode number 25, coming at you hot and heavy. How you doing, Mike? Oh, doing well, doing well, excited that we've uh, we've made it to 25. Yeah, yeah, and last uh, last week we had Tommy Chong, and I oh, know that, that was there was some, one. yes, a great episode. I know there were some technical issues due to uh, the RSS feed that was put out by our podcasting company. Um, but all those issues have been dealt with. So if you had that problem with the episode looping the first uh, four or five minutes over and over, the problem's been solved. So you can check it out. The trick is, if you had that problem, you're going to, if you downloaded the episode, you're going to have to get rid of that initial download and then download it again because the new uh, version that's there and available is uh, supposed to be fixed. So it yes. should be fine. And it's the complete uh, show with the interview and the cultivation and everything. So. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, we got another great show here for you this week as well. Um, Chanel Lindsay coming up later, but first... Yeah, our, think- our good friend Dr. Mitch. I, I mentioned last week that uh, we recorded with Mitch, but then you know we spent uh, such a long time with Tommy that we weren't able to include Mitch's segment last week, but we have him this week. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, so yeah, why don't we get right into the, uh, the Dr. Mitch segment? Uh, interview and let's take it from there all right so uh we are thrilled to once again be joined by a friend of the show dr mitch early wine a professor of psychology at suny albany and uh and cannabis author thank you so much for uh coming back on the show dr mitch oh i love being here thanks so much excellent excellent so uh, you know, obviously, uh, it's been a few weeks since you've been on, but we have a lot to talk about. And right off the bat, one of the things that you uh, wanted to talk about was how gender can affect the assessment of cannabis problems. Sure thing. Back in 2006, I published a paper suggesting that uh, one of the popular questionnaires about troubles generated by the plant was biased against women, basically, because items like uh, do your friends give you trouble about how much pot you smoke or do family members say you smoke too much? Those were ending up being exaggerated in the samples of women, even if they said the exact same thing on all the other items. And I think maybe at the time it was just because people were more willing to give women trouble about cannabis use than, than they were men. We just got a new paper accepted, though, showing that uh, that's no longer the case. So I don't know if it's necessarily a good thing, but at least people are just as willing to tell women as men when they think they're they're smoking a little too much. And it's no longer overestimating cannabis problems in women. And I feel like that's going to be a, at least a more fair way to go about assessing some of this research. Yeah, really interesting. And and then there's also issues in addition to, to gender. There's always an issue with cannabis and how it is seen by the people who oppose it. And uh, as Dan and I were talking about last week, um, th- there's this long history of propaganda when it comes to cannabis and its ability to cause mental illness in people who use it. And, and despite the fact that there's a ton of research out there and everything shows that it's a, a benign, safe substance to consume, there's still this weird tie of cannabis and psychosis. Sad but true. And, you know, again, I'm not saying cannabis is perfectly harmful, harmless in all doses for everyone. But uh, we've been hearing about this since literally 1100 AD. Like somebody has been saying that plant's going to make you crazy. And 
Unfortunately, I keep seeing these citations where they'll go five studies of college students show the the ones who are uh, smoking cannabis are more likely to have schizotypal personality disorder. And I thought, give me a break. Let me take a look at this and gather a whole bunch of data on that scale and a bunch of other drug use measures. And first and foremost, uh, it turned out that one of the items was biased against cannabis users. I use words in strange and unusual ways, true or false. I mean, who who kicks back in the crib with the chronic is going to say, I don't use words in strange and unusual ways, right? So the item just doesn't mean the same thing to cannabis users. So they were endorsing it and getting higher scores. As soon as I took that item out, the differences all disappeared. And then my student, Nicholas Von Dahm, we had a really candid, candid very anonymous uh, way to administer the survey showed Actually, if anything, it's probably the dopaminergic drugs like cocaine or meth or amphetamine that are potentially leading to increases in these symptoms. And that's consistent with some of our models of psychosis. Getting dopamine cranked up really high is just not something that's uh, a good habit in the long term. And that seems to be potentially the real source of this difference. It's interesting to me because it seems like I mean, it doesn't seem like it seems obvious that uh, studies that, you know, show what the government wants to hear are, you know, elevated and studies that show what they don't are suppressed. I mean, you can go look at the, uh, you know, the LaGuardia back, you know, he commissioned a study about cannabis and it showed that, you know, it was relatively benign and harmless and, you know, they suppressed it. And the same thing happened with Nixon. Uh, and, you know, this is like cultural Lysenkoism. And there's the, the idea that, you know, you can use uh, science for propaganda and political goals, even when, you know, mo- some of the science doesn't show what you want it to. And that, you know, that <laughs> I'm, I'm Russian born and uh, a big fan of Nikolai Vavilov. And, and, and that whole story is just insane to me that, you know, this guy Lysenko could show up and basically convince Stalin that, you know, he could be growing pineapples in Antarctica if it wasn't for, you know, this bourgeois Mendelian genetics and things like that. That, And, and you know, ultimately, you know, he he was eventually after Stalin's death renounced and and um, but but people were people died because of this. You know, a lot of scientists and uh, geneticists were were either put in jail or put to death because they didn't agree with the, you know, Stalin's narrative and Lysenko's narrative. And I think, you know, it's not, we haven't gotten to that extreme yet here. Uh, But certainly, you know, if you look at Dr. Lester Grinspoon and how he was never, you know, elevated to full professorship and tenure, um, you know, it's just seems crazy that we, you know, we just continue to, to, you know, either deny the science when when it doesn't suit our purposes or uh, create, you know, studies that do. You know, it, it's just, it goes against all scientific met- methodology, I believe, you know. And it's just, these are the data. I, I'm just saying, here's how it turned out, you know. And it's funny because not only uh, consumers, but also consumers of research, and then folks who are on these ethics boards approving some of these studies. So they believe all this nonsense. So I was trying to do a CBD trial for anxiety, and they were freaking out. And folks can buy CBD in any corner in almost every city, but God forbid I would give it to them, you know. So I admire that people are skeptical of science now, but I want to make sure folks understand what they can trust and what they can't, because I got some of my friends back in the Midwest who are just dismissive of, of all data. And they think, Oh, I got two friends who did this. So it must be true. It's, it's a rough, it's a rough way to think. Definitely. Yeah. And there was a lot to unpack in Dan's former uh, statement. Uh, he, was, he referred to, um, to former governor Fiorello LaGuardia, who had his uh, committee look into cannabis. And of course that committee found that it was um, a harmless uh, substance that was not a gateway drug, but that study was more or less ignored. And in addition, uh, Dan mentioned uh, Lysenko, who of course was the um, the Russian biologist who also was a, a proponent of pseudoscience. And, and if you uh, listen to this podcast long enough, I'm sure uh, you will hear Dan speak of him again. But um, you also mentioned, Danko, uh, Dr. Lester Grinspoon. 
a man who uh, obviously we all have a, a great deal of respect for. And one of the things uh, that was very important to him in uh, in studying cannabis and, and also in being um, a cannabis user, an appreciator of cannabis, was the idea of um, enhancement. And so Dr. Grinspoon believed that uh, cannabis had the ability to um, enhance people's uh, lives, you know, their enjoyment of music or art or nature. And, uh, you know, obviously an important um, part of enhancement is the ability to savor. And, uh, and you, Mitch, you have uh, some research into savoring cannabis as a buffer against potential problems. It's really cool. So we've, we've had the same finding in two pretty disparate data sets. Mindfulness was all the rage for so long now, and I'm sure you guys uh, hear about it all the time as this kind of stress reduction strategy. And that link to cannabis was really inconsistent in the literature, but I felt like something must be going on here. And so there's a subset of mindfulness, if you will, called savoring, where you're going to not only pay attention to the current moment, but really relish the current moment anticipate good things in the future, reminisce about things in the past. And making that a habit does seem to have all kinds of nice positive effects just on stress and happiness. It turned out it also buffers folks against developing problems, even if they're heavy users. So the link between use and problems got smaller in one study. And just the general link between savoring and problems uh, was significant. So the more you savor, the fewer problems you have. And even if you are smoking a lot, it seems like that's got a lot of potential. So my student Maha Mian is actually proposing a dissertation where folks will learn to savor more often, have these little exercises where they do so across some time and see if it actually does help reduce harm. And as you might guess, in the previous data, we said, would you prefer this or like a standard harm reduction thing, like just smoke less or you know, only smoke at home or something. And nobody was interested in those, right? They want to know, you know. And so we've added some items too about savoring cannabis itself, because I do feel like you guys are a great example of that, where you talk about it and how it tastes and what the odor is and uh, fine distinctions in the subjective effects. Obviously, you're not going to be smoking unconsciously and kind of overdoing it if that's the way you treat the plant. Yeah, I can remember uh, Dr. Grinspoon using the word enhancement. Um, you know, can, uh, cannabis is a medicine, but can also be an enhancement for um, intimacy, for just sitting down and watching a movie, or um, as you mentioned, kind of just being in the moment, which, you know, people pay a lot of money for <laughs> for uh, <laughs> psychiatric help and, and self-help books and all these things about, you know, yoga and everything to put you in the moment. And I think cannabis... Um, really does play that role for for a lot of people, and uh, yeah, I think it's just important to to for that people understand that it, it you know this isn't just uh, a way to get out of reality, but a way to enhance that reality. Um, and that's really you know one of the things that he kept hammering away at is that you know you can, you know depending on how you use cannabis can you know can be the difference between it you know helping you or hindering you. Uh, in any way. I got to admit too, just informally in cognitive therapy, a lot of times what you're trying to do is get people to think about their thought as just a thought, not necessarily a complete reflection of all reality. And folks who've used cannabis get that notion markedly quicker than folks who've really never experienced their thoughts anyway, but the way they always are. And so they have a harder time questioning uh, the evaluation of the thing and separating that from the thing itself. And so you can imagine depressed folks, anxious folks, the way they see ambiguous stimuli is very different from folks who are happy. And so to be able to point that out with somebody makes the treatment go markedly faster. Yeah, I think that also probably has a lot to do with why uh, psychedelics are uh, are so effective in treating, you know, depression and stress and, and things like that, because it just, you just see things in a different way and it takes you outside of, of your, either your comfort zone or, or just the zone that you've been in and allows you to view it, um, in, at, in a different light. And I think that has a lot to do with, uh, pulling people out of a funk. One of the ayahuasca researchers said, uh, 
he's done one of the bigger depression trials and said, basically clients said, uh, not only do I know it's going to be all right, I believe it. Right. And it's like this distinction between here's a thought and here's, I really think this, I think it a lot. I believe it. And that's hard to articulate. And as you can imagine, almost impossible to, to measure, but I really do feel like that's what's going on with these as far as uh, decreasing anxiety, improving depression, and even apparently some of the quitting cigarette smoking uh, literature as well. So it's a neat field. That is very interesting. And, um, you know, as you uh, as you alluded to, this show is all about getting people to uh, to savor more and also, you know, using cannabis to enhance their lives. And we hope that um, our love of the topic and uh, descriptions thereof help people do that. So, as always, thank you so much, Dr. Mitch, for coming on the show. We uh, we really appreciate it. Looking if any of our uh, listeners have a question that they would like to ask you or want to get in touch with you, what, what would be the best way for them to reach you? So my uh, email address, 420research at Gmail, I get a lot, but I, I almost always answer. It's just the numbers 420research at gmail.com. Thank you so much, Dr. Mitch. We appreciate it. And uh, we'll be back with more Grow Bud Yourself. All right, Dr. Mitch. Yeah, always a great guest and uh, always very insightful and interesting and amazing to me that, you know, there's always more new things to learn about cannabis, even from, you know, a psychological level. Yeah, no, there is. And Mitch is a great resource. So uh, we, we really do hope that you guys are enjoying those segments. Uh, we, we love to have him on every uh, every month or so. And also, you know, if you have a question that you would like uh, Dr. Mitch to address, you could send that to us as well over at uh, info at growbudyourself.com. Yeah, 100%. And uh, please ask away because, uh, you know, he, he's a, an amazing resource when it comes to uh, cannabis in the brain and, and all kinds of different uh, aspects of the science of the plant. Very true. All right. So uh, that was Dr. Mitch, but we have a really uh, excellent interview with Chanel Lindsay, who, in addition to being an attorney, is also the uh, CEO and president of Ardent Cannabis, and I guess uh, the inventor of the Nova Cannabis Decarboxylator. Absolutely, and also very heavily involved in uh, the activism situation, uh, legalization in Massachusetts, social equity, all kinds of amazing um, things that she's accomplished in her life, and, and uh, a great interview as well. So without any further ado, we will be back after these messages with Chanel Lindsay. Hey, you guys, this episode is brought to you by Excelsior Extracts and their incredible THC infused relief rub. Uh, and now this stuff really works. And uh, I know it works because it's made by our friend Outcast, and she needs very, very strong topicals. Uh, so the Relief Rub is the strongest topical I've ever tried. Check them out on Instagram at Excelsior Extracts, all one word. Uh, DM them for info on the Relief Rub if you're interested, and uh, give them a follow. Uh, they're great people, and they grow great cannabis and make great products. So thank you to Excelsior Extracts. Now back to the show. All right. We are thrilled to be joined by Chanel Lindsay, the founder and CEO of Ardent and a, a longtime friend of the cannabis movement. So welcome. Thank you for joining us, Chanel. Hello, hello. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Awesome. And um, you, of people who may not know, you are in addition to being the founder and CEO of Ardent. You're an attorney and uh, you fight for, for cannabis legalization and marijuana law reform. But all of that kind of started with you being a patient, right? Definitely. Way, way back when, it seems like now. <laughs> And so maybe you could fill us in on the, the founding of Ardent. Uh, that that came about because you were trying to find uh, proper dosing to treat chronic pain? Yeah. So when I was in my late teens, I started smoking cannabis like many people do. And um, at first I was getting a lot of relief from a cyst 
that I had an ovarian cyst that was really um, bothering me after my son was born. Um, so my, I had my son when I was 19. And, um, and really at that time was the first time I really started uh, thinking about using cannabis in a way other than smoking. It had been giving me a lot of relief for anxiety and other things um, that I was using it for, it for before my son was born. But when I got that really localized specific issue of having this ovarian cyst, um, I really need to start thinking kind of outside of the box because there was pain and inflammation that I was trying to reach. And I had heard and obviously like read about, um, you know, the medical cannabis movement um, and the ability to use cannabis to treat, right? Because it was, it was happening in California and people were really making great strides there, but there really wasn't any kind of access here in Massachusetts for anything other than, you know, honestly, really not so great uh, quality, but that I had access to at that point, you know, just being young and not having a lot of, you know, connections. And so, um, and so I started um, doing research, right? Um, and figuring out how to go ahead because I wasn't going to ex spend this uh, expensive bud, you know, just throwing it in a pot of boiling water and not knowing what was going to happen to it. But honestly, back then when I was going on the Internet, you just would find, you know, such um, conflicting advice about how to prepare cannabis medicine and none of it had any testing results or anything there uh, behind it. And so there was a lot of conjecture. And for me, it was really just like hit or miss, right? I was making products and either they were kind of like working okay or not working uh, so great. And I would say over a, a, the course of 10 years, I really just kind of experimented and made all kinds of different products different ways and kind of figured out what the best process I thought was, right? And that, that was using my crock pot um, and it was also using the oven method. And I got to a point where I was really um, getting pretty consistent medicine, but I was really frustrated with the fact that it was like stinking up the entire house. And I really wasn't able to, um, you know, as, as many people who are probably listening know, like the kind of the first time you're experimenting, you're, you know, you're, you're taking alcohol tincture straight, you know, you're like, throwing up because you're eating stuff that like doesn't really, you know, sit well with you. And for me, what ended up happening was even when I got kind of in a good zone about like making butter and using that. And, you know, I also was just like eating a lot of butter every day. Right. And I was just thinking, um, hey, long term, I'm trying to like, you know, add and, you know, control my weight and health. And this doesn't seem like it's really helping. And so um, that was always, uh, you know, as I was becoming an attorney, like you mentioned, at the same time, I was like building up this cannabis skill set. So it was interesting. I was like becoming this a tra traditional lawyer, but at the same time, like understanding and loving the plant, but also like dated every single day encountering like the hypocrisy of the stigma around cannabis, like versus the stigma around other things that I was seeing, not just in college, right? But even in like the, um, even in the professional world, you know, attorneys have a very, very high rate of alcohol and drug abuse, right? It's a, it's a very um, difficult profession where you're, especially if you're in litigation, like I was, you're in court all the time. It's a very, very high stress job. And I would see uh, women and men, but like turn to things like, you know, pills and benzos and alcohol and doing a lot of unhealthy things. But yet at the same time, you know, the idea of cannabis or one thing that happened, you know, when I was a young lawyer was that a... Um, a uh, very prominent, like Harvard law professor, got arrested because he was um, growing can, you know, growing bud in his backyard. And I was really surprised when I went into the law firm the next day. And instead of people being like, "That's outrageous," you know, that that he was in trouble, it was like, "Oh, how could he be so stupid?" Right. And so that was very concerning to me because at that point I had plants growing in my spare bedroom. And so <laughs> I was kind of like, "Well, um, if that's the case, then." Um, you know, that that was very scary. And it wasn't actually long after that, that I got arrested, you know, on my way to work with some of my, you know, medicinal, but, you know, cannabis in my back seat in a, um, in a jar. And I actually had a little bit kind of in the front and um, the, the police officer I got pulled over just like not taking for taking a right on red um, at a light. And so just, you know, not paying attention. And when he saw he just, 
arrested me. It was less than half an ounce at that point, right? So I should have just got a ticket. And instead I was arrested. My car was impounded. They almost brought me down and arraigned me in the same court where I was representing clients. So like basically my whole career would have been over. And that was a real, real like wake up call of, wow, this is, I thought this was getting better, but it's actually not. And, um, you know, how are we going to potentially like impact that to make it different? Honestly, that day, I was just like really glad I was able to talk my, talk my way out of it and actually not get down and be brought to be arraigned. But I'll tell you, it took all the legal training that I had to come up with the arguments of like, you're violating my civil rights by having me, you know, handcuffed here, booking me for an arrest that should just be a ticket. Um, so yeah, that was kind of the journey and the genesis of, of Ardent and just like my desire to both be a part of the cannabis industry and um, change the, the laws around what was happening. Well, obviously, the uh, the laws do need changing. If you went through all of that after there was decriminalization in Massachusetts. I know. And I would I was surprised. Right. And um, really thought at that point that really we had some protection. But when you really think about decriminalization, think of what it is. Right. It's a uh, it is not actually illegal anything. Right. It's taking something and making it a civil violate, making a small carve out for a civil um, you know, violation, but still almost everything remains illegal, right? Like when you look at decriminalization, it's usually like one ounce that you have that's possession only. So it's really, really easy to get around that. In my case, they just tried to say, oh, it looks like more than it is, right? So that's one way to say that it's more than one ounce. But if even if you have um, a lower amount, for example, when we were fighting for, for full legalization, there's a case in Massachusetts that we found, which was this young kid, Umberto H., that's the name of the case, you can find it, but he was this young kid, high school student, after decriminalization, went to school, had four joints on him, right? Four joints, so little that the actual street value was named a zero in the police report. And when he was caught with his four joints, not only they didn't just give him a ticket, they charged him with possession with intent to distribute, right? And, and so there's a very easy way to get around decriminalization if uh, if the police want to, right? So it just becomes something that still just protects those people that um, that that law enforcement wants to give that discretion to. And we know that that's not people of color. We know that that's not, and honestly, anybody that they don't like. And so um, it's really what people need to be fighting for is a real legal carve out for um, cannabis use for anybody. And again, that's what we were able to thankfully get in Massachusetts, uh, you know, a real, um, you, you start to be able to not infringe in all of these different ways when you actually have, um, a, you know, legal law on the books. Which you were an author of and spokeswoman for. Yay. Yes. That was, that was fun and awesome. And again, um, you know, you mentioned uh, Mike earlier about being an attorney. It's been kind of eerie how like being an attorney and loving weed at the same time have like come together in my life to be able to do the things that I wanted to do, like build a business, but also at the same time, like have this, um, uh, have this ability to opine on the law or bring, you know, after, even after the law ha ha was passed, we've worked now, um, and I say we, I mean, Eon Equitable Opportunities Now, which is a nonprofit that I was a co-founder of um, after legalization. We've been working with Northeastern Law School over the last three years to um, to fight. And, um, you know, the, the law students there basically spend an entire semester doing legal research around different issues, um, like that we're trying to push around equity. So that when when we're sitting either talking to the commission or talking to, you know, cities or towns and they say, well, it's not legal to do this or that. We're able to be like, no, yes, it is. You know, and, and those things I found have been really, um, you know, powerful in being able to try to move the needle in the right you know direction. And so I've been really you know lucky in that way to have that you know opportunity. And you're, you still are uh, speaking out for people that are affected adversely by the war on drugs and small business owners, women, people of color. What, what are some of the things that you're, you're doing to help their cause? Yeah, absolutely. So after um, after legalization, um, you know, I was not only fortunate enough to help write uh, the Massachusetts law, but then after it was passed, um, I was appointed by the treasurer to the Mass Cannabis Advisory Board. 
So this is an advisory board of it's like 25 people um, from different parts. Uh, some of us are from the industry. Not enough of us, honestly, are activists. Um, and uh, there's public health people, there's law enforcement, and basically we um, write recommendations for the commission. And so through that kind of official, you know, capacity, I, I was the chair of the market participation subcommittee. And that in the law is a subcommittee that has to be focused on small businesses and making sure that there's access in the industry. And so over these last couple of years, we've really pushed for, um, you know, expanding delivery, which was is a big win with that we're fingers crossed right about to get. Um, but actually, you know, working with the commission to make it clear to cities and towns, like what they could do around equity, like in the beginning, when the laws are passed, nobody knows really how to implement them, right. And it's really important, especially at the city and town level, to make sure that they're doing the same things when it comes to equity that the state was doing. And in Massachusetts, a lot of cities and towns were like, well, we don't have to do any of that. Um, and so we're fighting against that. But then other cities and towns were like, we want to do something, but how do we do that? And so, again, working with Northeastern, kind of like coming up with these legal reports that then we can give to the cities and towns and then also working from the commission level and pushing them to um, give guidance, like official guidance from the commission to make the cities and towns, like give them comfort to do that. So it's been, definitely been an education in, um, you know, like kind of like municipal law and local things. And it wasn't something I was involved in before, you know, before I was just a litigator and, you know, uh, doing things on, you know talking with business owners about disputes, right? Versus kind of like working on the political side of things. And um, I'm definitely a person who's like, like jaded when it comes to politics and government and other stuff like that. So this has been a very interesting, you know, ride kind of becoming very involved and invested and, in, you know, making sure. And definitely I've seen along the way, you know, we had the best equity program on paper in the entire nation in the first, right? Um, and over these last couple of years, what we've seen is that has not really panned out. You still look at Massachusetts, it's still, incredibly dominated by large businesses. Almost all small businesses have been pushed out. Almost all, you know, uh, people of color, black people, there's almost no, um, you know, representation there. And so I think that it's something that we're going to continue to fight and work on. Um, and then the other piece is, it, I kind of see it as three ways, right? You have to attack it through kind of like the official channels of, you know, working with the legislature, working with the commission, you know, doing that kind of thing. And then you also have to kind of like work on the community community side, right? And like get the community together to fight back and, and request and demand these things. And that's what we do through Eon, Equitable Opportunities Now. We realized really early on that any equity language that we got in was going to get challenged. And that's every single time that's happened along the way, whether it's like being challenged behind closed doors or being challenged in lawsuits, like that's something that we need to be there to support. And so we work with the community to, to raise their voices up, but we also work um, to bring education to them. And we're kind of a group eon we're like a group of activist business owners and what we do is we take up the successes in our own businesses and we push that back into educating people in the community on that but also on the on the opportunities that we get um, going forward, like, for example, delivery, which is going to be exclusive um, for equity uh, folks for the first two years. And so we try to fight for things like that, because we see even with the great equity program on paper, it's still, you know, we still need to be more aggressive because, you know, to be honest, it's not working. Uh, we need to make sure that we kind of have one chance here. As you know, once dispensaries come, you know, and all the properties eaten up, like it's it's over. You know what I mean? There's not like it's not an endless supply. So you got to, you know, make moves when you can. Yeah. Now, just out of curiosity, as you kind of look around the legal landscape across the country, is there any state that you feel is doing social equity particularly well? Ooh, um, I I think um, in the last couple of months, and I have, I'll be honest, I've been very heads down in what's happening in Massachusetts, but I know that like Oregon and Washington are starting to do some really good things, you know? Um, do I think it's early enough? No. Right. Uh, and that's the challenge is actually like getting there before all of like the MSOs and all the special interests, like get there and lay the groundwork. And it's like almost impossible. Right. And it, especially when you're looking over here at like the East Coast, because you know, because everybody's so afraid of cannabis, the way that it naturally comes to a state is like with such a stranglehold on it already, right? Like in Massachusetts, when, we, when, when medical came, it's, oh, you have to have 500K in the bank. 
you have to have $30,000 non-refundable fee. So you just, the way that it's set up from the beginning is like only the big guys can come in and do that, you know? And so I think that there needs to be a way at the very beginning um, that you're educating folks and able to uh, make sure that there's a even playing field, like right from the outset. And I find that that doesn't happen. And even when you look around the rest of the country right now, look at the South and Florida and that kind of thing, like there's no equity in that medical program. And so to think that that's going to change in adult use, you know, that is, um, I think that's really naive to think. So I am really excited what's going to be about what's happening, um, you know, in the Northeast, right? I'm really excited about what's going to be happening in the tri-state area, right? Um, Because there has been a real focus on equity. And I, I'm, the, the things that make me sad about what happened in Massachusetts, at least there's a silver lining of other states were able to learn from that. And uh, hopefully take that on, into account when, you know, when New York and New Jersey and Connecticut are, you know, starting to move in the right direction there. Uh, hopefully we'll actually see some really strong pieces around equity. Absolutely. Yeah. So for the people who are um, who would benefit from using cannabis either for pain or just because they enjoy it, let's let's talk a little bit about what Ardent does and uh, and the products that you have. The original uh, product, right? The Nova decarboxylator. Um, how 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 did that improve dosing for for patients and for cannabis users? So Nova is a precision, so it's a lab grade decarboxylation device. And um, in, like I mentioned, those 10 plus years where I was just dabbling and, you know, doing and making products on my own and anybody else who's out there making cannabis, you know, products, the one thing you quickly realize is that if you're supposed to be getting a very precise uh, time and temperature specifically, you know, it's almost impossible to do that with an oven or a toaster oven or a crock pot and get that really even heating without any hot spots or without any kind of, you know, um, variations there. And so what Nova does is actually uses like a thermal blanket that encapsulates the entire device rather than having um, heating elements at the top and the bottom like you would on an oven. Uh, And then we also use two sensors. So there are dual sensors in there that are tied to an algorithm that's actually controlling it to a, you know, lab grade level. And so you're really getting um, an even heating, a heating um, and activation essentially. So people who don't know, uh, THC and CBD actually don't exist in the plant uh, in any uh, real uh, discernible form uh, amount that you would want. It's actually in an acid layer, right? So think about your THC and the CBD and they have this little knob of acid on them um, and it, it prevents that from connecting with your CB1 and CB2 receptors, right? And there is a process, a heating process. And when you think about it, it makes sense. When people use cannabis, they're almost always using heat on it, right? To smoke it or baking it. And it's not just because, you know, people like to smoke. It's because that that actual heating uh, releases that a- acidic piece and makes the THC and CBD viable. However, it's the, the underlying cannabinoids, THC and CBD are sensitive, right? And just as you're doing that heating process, it's very easy to damage the THC and CBD underneath. And so for me, by the, when I went to the lab, even somebody, you know, at almost 15 years experience making cannabis products um, for medical purposes, I was still, you know, burning off or not activating either both of those you want to avoid an average of 30 to 35% every single time. And that was me being an expert. And so that's a third of my medicine that was, you know, not being uh, used. And what we saw was the labs, MCR labs um, is where I did a lot of the experimentation for, you know, honing in on these right time and temperatures and also seeing that even if, you know, you have your oven or toaster oven on that temperature, it's really not going to give you the results that you're looking for. And we saw people coming in there that were making can, you know, tinctures for patients and it had no THC in it. You know, they were coming in like, why isn't this working? And it was like, yeah, because there's nothing in it. And so um, that that for me was a real wake up call that like, wow, the market really does need something like this. And it was right. You know, this was right at the time where medical marijuana was coming to Massachusetts. Right. So, you know, with legalization, what happens is all of a sudden, you know, one day people aren't interested in it because it's illegal. But the next day that it is legal, everybody's ready to try it. And you started to see people in Massachusetts really like wanting to be into it. And I realized like, hey, if people don't have an easy way to do this at home because, you know, 
dispensaries didn't come to Massachusetts for like four years, um, that they were going to try to make this and then they were going to come to the conclusion that cannabis didn't work for them. But it was only because they weren't doing it right. It had nothing to do with like the cannabis's ability. They just were not able to access it. And so we've seen that, you know, um, and been really happy and proud to be that kind of bridge for people between, you know, having this desire, having this plant in hand and not knowing how to get to A to Z or in even more developed markets like California and people where people do have access to it, being able to just like more affordably make their product and be able to make things that like maybe they'd never be able to get on a dispensary shelf, like ice cream or other things if there are kind of restrictions on where there are. And also a ton of folks, um, you know, legalization is awesome, but what ends up happening is there start to be things like restriction on potency, right? Restriction on the amount of milligrams. So if you have somebody, there are a lot of people out there that are very high tolerance. And I mean, you're talking about, especially people who are using it for pain who are coming from opiates and stuff like that. Those are that, those are folks that really need to be able to control their dose. And, um, both ways, but usually in a regulated market, Massachusetts, for example, five milligrams is the amount, the max, you know, single serving for an edible. So if you need a hundred, you're like you're you're having to stack on lots of different products rather than being able to just like really make what you need there. And so that's I think some of the ways that um, I've seen us be most kind of impactful in people's lives. And you have a, a new product coming out, right? The the Ardent FX. Yeah, so we actually launched FX um, right around for it was for 420 of for of 2020, you know, really special. And it's funny, I was saying the other day, we actually went live on 420 on uh, for on Facebook Live for four hours and 20 minutes. And <laughs> by the end, I could hardly stand up because we were like making a bunch of edibles and then eating them the entire time. So it was fun. But also, <laughs> I don't think I've, I've gone on a live since then. But um, but yeah, it was interesting. We um, launched it right as COVID was happening. And so it really was um, kind of on the nose as far as like what we people were doing at the time, because it was um, same functionality as the Nova and the ability to activate um, and but it has a separate CBD setting. So it has a special uh, optimized CBD setting. It also decarbs a quarter pound at a time rather than just an ounce. And so from the very beginning, you can imagine with Nova being only an ounce, that's perfect for a lot of people, but just tiny for other folks. And so we actually have some producers that had like six Novas and they just had them all lined up and they would just, you know, um, put them on. But obviously having something that was a little bit larger for people um, was really important. So uh, having that larger capacity and then the ability to actually cook inside of it, right? So, so you can bake little cakes and, um, and cookies and you can actually like cook ramen and boil pasta and make the things inside. And so for us, just having that capability of kind of being able to have your edibles kitchen wherever you want um, before when we were traveling a lot, um, as we were getting ready to launch, we had this in every hotel room, we would use it to heat up our leftovers, we'd use it to make our butt, you know, our, our decarb caps and stuff like that. Um, and the idea is that a lot of people, especially as they're getting into it, they might not have access to an oven or a kitchen, right, that they can use, especially if you're in like a shared roommate situation or something like that, you might not be able to just take over the whole kitchen and like, just make cannabis you know, products on the stovetop. And so the idea was that this could take the place of the double boiler because it has an infusion setting. It also, you know, can can do anything that you need it to do. So we're excited about that. And also to start to infiltrate, you know, the mainstream culture because it can do anything like crafting. You can make, you can melt candles in there. You can make soaps. And like I said, it takes the place of a double boiler. So like maybe one day you'll see Girl Scouts around making products with Ardent, you know, <laughs> decarboxylators. Like that's my dream is that, you know, it really is this multi-purpose product that is just ingrained into people's lives in a normal way. And yeah, it has to do with cannabis, but, and it's probably that's, you know, it's best and most awesome use. And, and, you know, for me, my personal goal is that like, if you make it easier and cheaper for people to do this, right. Um, and this is the funny part. Sometimes like the cannabis, when you're making a cannabis product, the, the, the THC sometimes can be the cheapest part of it if you're doing it right, right? When you're talking about activating Innova, if you think about it this way, if you have bud that's 20% THC, when it comes out, there's going to be 200 milligrams in every single gram of flour, 
right? Like that's a lot of THC and you can, you can make your, you know, food, your edibles and things like that. But say if you have another gram, maybe you want to make a facial toner, maybe you want to make something, a topical or something. So I think more people will have uh, the ability to use cannabis in different ways rather than it just being so expensive and they need to just like only be able to buy the, the one thing that they really need rather than being able to see how many over the counter things that it can actually um, take the place of also. So. Very cool. That's terrific. Uh, Chanel Lindsay, thank you so much for joining us on Grow Bud Yourself. If people want to learn a little more about Ardent or uh, maybe learn a little bit more about you and what you're up to, uh, where would they go? Yeah, so they can find out all types of information on ardentcannabis.com. So it's A-R-D-E-N-T cannabis.com. And definitely check out our blog. You know, just a lot of uh, cool information that people can access for free to just, you know, educate themselves and educate, you know, their friends and family on it. So yeah, please come by, check us out. Awesome. Thank you once again, Chanel Lindsay, for joining us. Uh, We'll be back with more Grow Bud Yourself after this. All right, welcome back, and thank you to Chanel Lindsay for that uh, uh, insightful interview. Yeah, indeed. It was great to have uh, Chanel on the show, and um, if you want even more Chanel Lindsay, you could check out our uh, November issue of Northeast Leaf Magazine, where we're going to do a little write-up on her for that. Absolutely, Um, and I guess that now is the cultivation segment of the show. Yeah, and um, I don't know if you uh, have been paying attention to uh, the date, but I believe it has now been a fortnight, which of course means... Strain of the fortnight. Strain of the fortnight. (laughs) What have you got got for us this week? The strain of the fortnight is called Catfish, and this is a Cannabis Cup winner. It won uh, first place Sativa in the 2014 Michigan Cannabis Cup for... Uh, Arborside, our friend Rory at Arborside and Midnight Roots. Uh, um, so it's definitely, you know, real big strain in Michigan. Uh, Arborside is in Ann Arbor, a wonderful uh, dispensary with incredible selection of uh, cannabis, concentrates, edibles, everything you need. Uh, I think they even sell my book there. But uh, Catfish uh, originated as an accidental back cross. This was uh, basically Reserva Privada. Uh, OG18, which is part of the DNA genetics crew, um, Reserva Pravada's OG18 was accidentally backcrossed by uh, Midnight Roots and created this really interesting uh, phenotype uh, of a sativa. I mean, a long flowering time, 9 to 11 weeks, um, also definitely grows tall and lanky. Uh, we usually talk about plants stretching into like week two or three of flowering but this plant keeps stretching really all the way into week six of flowering but if you're patient uh you know the plant will bless you with a nice large dense yield so uh you just have to be patient go the full nine to eleven weeks um it'll also give you the munchies and uh i'm not sure which terpene in particular or the profile that that does that but this is a strain that will make you hungry so it's great uh for treating appetite loss uh, nausea if someone's undergoing chemotherapy, um, people that are suffering from uh, anorexia, Crohn's disease, any type of stomach issues uh, where the, they find it hard to uh, hard to eat, uh, it'll help with that for sure. And even those of us who don't have any issues, uh, you know, will definitely get hungry after smoking it. Uh, it's also very uplifting. Um, this is a good, uh, great strain for a camping trip, fishing trip, uh, a trip to the beach nice excursion uh and it's very uh cerebral so if you're an artist of any type uh it'll help inspire you uh and really uh keep you working on whatever it is you do so uh you can go to arborside.com that's uh to find out more about the dispensary um where you can find catfish on occasion (laughs) um usually sells out pretty quick but a michigan stalwart strain the catfish and shout out to Rory uh, for uh, providing that. All right. Yeah, indeed. Uh, excellent strain of the Fortnite. Uh, any ideas there on that name catfish? You know, uh, one of the things that Rory says about the catfish is the aroma 
which has scents of, of lemongrass, but actually Rory says uh, sweet swampy fish. Uh, I don't really smell that when I smell the catfish, but um, somehow uh, they get that swampy fish smell, and I think that's what gave it the name catfish. Okay, I was wondering maybe if it had something to do with like catfishing, you know, on social media. But, oh, uh, okay. apparently it's the odor, the uh, the aroma of catfish. Right. Which I don't know uh, which is worse there, but an excellent strain nonetheless. And yes, shouts to Rory. Yeah, shout outs to Rory and uh, Jake at Midnight Roots. All right, so thank you for that strain of the Fortnite. And um, listeners of Grow Bud Yourself know that each week, Dan breaks down a grow topic to help you become a better cannabis cultivator. So what would you like to discuss this week? So because so many people are harvesting, I want to do basically a harvesting timeline so that people understand the order in which um, you do these things, or at least, you know, my suggestions as to the order. Everybody has their debates about wet and dry trim. Um, But I'm going to get into that um, as well. So basically, once you've determined that it's time to harvest by looking very closely at your trichome gland heads uh, and and determining that they're mostly cloudy, Uh, some are amber, some are clear, but the majority of them, 80% or so, are cloudy and not clear and not amber. Boom. That's the time to take them down. So uh, you start the timeline based on taking down the plant. So if it's a big plant, you may need to go branch by branch. If it's not a huge plant, you can cut the whole base of the plant off. The next step in the timeline is to take off fan leaves. You can do this before or after cutting off the base of the plant. doesn't really matter in this timeline. But basically, take the big uh, fan leaves off. Those are the big leaves without a lot of trichomes on them. Uh, They're not, you know... uh, the leaves that you're later going to trim off the sugar leaf. So take all the fan leaves off, leave the sugar leaf on, and then you hang the plants upside down in a cool room uh, with some air circulation without having that air circulation directly onto those drying plants. Uh, A lot of water is going to be coming out of those plants in the next week or so. So uh, you want to have some exhaust. You don't want to have light, light and heat degrade THC. So moving along with the timeline, you're hanging those plants, you've taken off the fan leaves. Now you have to be patient and wait for them to dry until the stems snap instead of bending. At that point, the next step in the timeline is to trim the leaves off, the sugar leaves off, and individually cut the buds off. And when you're trimming, you want to also get in there and take those like little duck foot sections of basically leaf stem out as well. Be meticulous because this will definitely help help out later. Um, and all of that uh, sugar leaf and stuff that you trim off, you just store that for uh, making hash or making edibles or whatever you want to do with that tinctures or otherwise. Uh, and you trim each individual bud off of the branches and put those into jars to begin the curing process. So drying then curing now curing in glass jars sealed in a cool dark place uh at this point the moisture is going to come out we've talked about curing before you're basically getting that last bit of moisture um that's stuck kind of in the middle of your flowers to work its way out and sweat out uh into the jar every day or so open the jar burp it let the air out when you've reached a, a level of equilibrium where basically you're at around 20 to 25 percent moisture level from when you started uh you are in the mode where the bud is properly cured you don't need to keep opening and closing the jars just keep them in a cool uh dark place Um, not the fridge not the freezer not in plastic not in paper bags glass jars preferably opaque and now you know you've basically got well cured cannabis and you keep it in those jars it'll continue to cure over time um and mellow uh and you know that's the key basically there so remember that timeline uh you know don't take all the fan leaves off before you dry the plants that just makes them dry out quicker it reduces uh the flavor it exposes those glands 
to um, sunlight, which you know, or light of any kind, which can damage them and definitely release the terpenes. Uh, the slower dry will result in a better burning, better tasting product. So there you have it. That is the timeline for harvesting, which I know a lot of you are doing out there. If you're listening to this while you're trimming, take a break, smoke some hash, and then get right back to it. Enjoy. <laughs> Don't get uh, too cross-eyed. <laughs> you know, make make some fun out of it. You know, it doesn't have to be uh, a grueling task, even though sometimes it feels like one. So uh, enjoy and uh, continue with your harvest. And remember, you are a peaceful warrior for this amazing cannabis plant. So keep up the great work. Yes, some of the unsung heroes out there trimming the cannabis that we're all going to enjoy. So thank you guys and gals for uh, that. And thank you, Dan, for that grow topic. I'm sure that's going to help a lot of people. Also, we should just mention, uh, if you're looking for some tips on what to do with those fan leaves and sugar leaves you pull off your plants, uh, tune in to episode 24 because uh, Dan's grow topic there uh, broke down some of the stuff you could do with those leaves. Indeed. Yes. And now it is time to move on to some Grow Q&A. We're going to take some uh, questions from our listeners, and Dan is going to answer them here. So, if you have a question that you would like answered on this show, get in touch with us. Uh, the best way is to email. That is info at growbudyourself.com. Uh, you could also reach us on social media, the Patreon, YouTube. Uh, definitely get in touch with us. We want to help you grow better pot. So, let's jump in. Uh, starting off with that bloke who writes, Hi, Danny and Mike. I just finished up my first grow, and I have some THC and CBD plant material to play with. Uh, green gelato and sweet pure CBD. Not as big as I would have liked, but it's my first time. Um, I use the ceramic metal halide 315 watt in a tent setup. Uh, next time, I will be much more prepared. I've enjoyed listening to the show and the topics, but as yet... Uh, the tincture process has not cropped up. Can you go through the method that you have for tinctures? Cheers, lads. Keep up the good work. So uh, what would you say to that bloke regarding tinctures? Absolutely. I uh, uh, Tinctures are a wonderful way to use up some of that uh, plant material. Uh, tinctures are basically concentrations that result from soaking uh, either leaf or, you know, preferably buds and resins, uh, typically in alcohol, although, you know, there's alternatives to alcohol-based tinctures. So I'm going to describe both. Um, extractions administered using a dropper um, or a sprayer under the tongue for quick absorption and very fast-acting pain-killing properties. So uh, as long as they're properly made and administered, tinctures can be uh, a godsend. So I'm going to start with making alcohol tincture. Uh, you start with 90% pure alcohol. You can use... Uh, 190 proof Everclear. Um, soak your chosen dry bud or leaf in that alcohol in a jar at least overnight, uh, but up to a month if desired. Uh, the longer you leave it, the more potent your tincture will be. You know, stir it around, swing it around a little bit. Um, then you want to strain out the solids, uh, store that tincture in a sealed dark colored jar or bottle in a dark, cool place. Um, you can also use a sweet liqueur for this, um, like brandy or schnapps, um, and then dissolve that in food or drinks for slower absorption. If you're interested in, um, you know, a bit of the, you know, slower acting uh, results. Now, for people who aren't interested in alcohol uh, tinctures for and for whatever reason, um, our old friend Subcool, rest in peace, um, transcribed a great recipe for vegetable glycerin-based tinctures that, that are perfect for patients, um, in particular people who just don't want to use alcohol. So um, he basically advises using finely ground buds, um, soaking that finely ground powder in your glycerin for about two months before separating the solids uh, with a 190 micron hash straining bag. And uh, for dosage, he recommends 15 milliliters added to unsweetened grape juice for a nice, potent, pleasant body buzz. Um, people that are out there suffering from migraines uh, really marvel at the efficacy of this type of tincture. Um, and of course, people who are uh, avoiding alcohol for whatever reason um, are happy to have an alternative to an alcohol-based tincture. So 
Um, those are two tincture recipes right there. One from our old friend and uh, fallen comrade, Subcool. And like I said, you know, a little bit of tincture, 15 to 20 milligrams under your tongue. Hold it there for a while. Don't just swallow it. Let it absorb. Uh, and you will be feeling the effects very quickly and uh, a nice quick rush to come on and a long lasting buzz as well. So good luck with that, that bloke. <laughs> Indeed, yes. The the sublingual tincture is very popular these days. Yes, indeed. I mean, it just goes right into the bloodstream uh, rather than having to, you know, go into the liver uh, like most edibles do. And then, you know, the blood-brain barrier is, uh, is <laughs> basically uh, conquered very quickly with that tincture method because it just goes right into your blood and right to your brain. All right. Very good. We, we hope that helps you out, that bloke. And uh, let's move on uh, to Facebook, where Kevin writes, Hey guys, thanks so much for the awesome show. I always look forward to Thursdays and your new podcast. Uh, keep up the great work and the informative podcast that's very professional without the annoying bong rips, uh, as far as I could tell, that some others do throughout their shows. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> we're not against bong rips. No, no, no. We're pro bong rips. But yes, you're right. We keep it very professional here. Um, so my question for you, <laughs> uh, my first plant went through some unfortunate changes. It started out in a two by two tent, but I had to move it outside in South Texas due to space issues with the deep water culture grow. Uh, the plant must have gone from flower back to veg when it was outside in the middle of the summer, and it's now back in the flowering stage. So the plant is 200 plus days old, and I'm constantly drooling over it to finish. I keep checking the trichomes with a jeweler's loop, but there's no amber other than a couple on a random sugar leaf and none on the calyxes, which is not enough for me to feel comfortable harvesting it after such a long wait. Uh, have you ever heard of a plant not producing amber trichomes? Thanks again. Happy growing. So uh, what would you say to Kevin? Yeah, um, I just think that the plant is not yet ready to harvest um, because it you know, switched back to uh, veg and now has started flowering again. Basically, you got to start that flowering time back at day one. Um, as Soma uh, eloquently says, you know, when you think it's time to harvest, wait a week. <laughs> so I think you still have uh, a few weeks or so, and I think you will start seeing um, the beginnings of some amber trichomes forming, and then you can harvest. I've never heard of a plant not producing amber trichomes eventually, so... Um, I think it's just, you know, you just have to be patient and wait it out. And, uh, because you're in Texas, hopefully you have the time <laughs> to wait, um, because hopefully you will not have any kind of frost, especially in South Texas. So, um, leave it out a bit. And I think you'll start seeing those changes. And again, if they're cloudy and just start to go Amber harvest right away. All right. Makes sense. And, uh, and hang in there, Kevin. We hope that helps you out. Uh, let's move on to Jamie, who writes, Hey guys, hope you're well. Uh, I have four auto flowers growing at the moment. Three of them are four weeks into flower, but one of them is being a douche and won't leave veg. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, I'm guessing that this is actually a photo period plant, and uh, I would need to flip the light cycle to 12-12 to get her to flower. Um, is there another way around this? If I take the plant out and keep her in darkness for a few days, would this get her to start flowering? If so, I could put her back in with the others on the 18-6 light schedule, or would this put her back into veg? Uh, could I drop my lighting schedule slightly to maybe a 16 by 8 or 14-10 without it negatively affecting the flowering plants? Uh, I really don't want to kill her. She's my favorite of the bunch. I mean, you uh, called her a douche, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I guess sometimes your favorites can still be a little, little frustrating. That's frustration speaking. Anyway, um, as always, you guys are the best. I always look forward to Friday, uh, my Friday drive to work listening to the podcast. So uh, what would you say to Jamie? Yes. Um, it sounds like you're right and that the plant is a photo period plant, meaning it's not an autoflower. Uh, the only way, real way around it is to remove the plant, you know, every day for, you know, if you're, if you're using uh, 18.6, um, light cycle, for instance, you'd have to take it out for six of the 18 hours 
per day. Uh, that can be annoying to do for, you know, 60, 65 days. Um, but it's really the only solution because if you take her out for a little while and she starts flowering, the minute you put her back in there, like you said, she's going to re veg. Um, if she's an, if she's not an auto, um, and if you drop your light schedule on, on your other three autos, you're just going to get, have, uh, lower yields on those autos. Uh, and even with a 16, eight or a 14, 10, your, your douchey plant <laughs> probably won't even start flowering. So if you really don't want to kill her, um, you know, get, purchase a small tent, you know, or something or put her in a separate place and put her under 12, 12, um, and then flower her out separately. Um, if, you know, if the other three plants aren't that important to you, then maybe just drop everything to 12, 12 and, um, you know, they'll still survive. They'll still continue to flower. They just won't probably won't fill out like you want them to. So that's the solution there. And, uh, you know, next time purchase auto flowers, uh, from a reputable company. So you won't get, uh, that like funny douchey one. <laughs> All right. Uh, we hope that helps you out, Jamie. Let's uh, let's take a couple more here. Uh, let's move on to D Man. Hey, rad dudes. Nice, nice. Um, I love your show. Keep it going. Uh, I've been growing for many years and growing my favorite strains year after year: Chem Dog, Pineapple Chunk, and Skittles. Uh, this year, out here in Cali, the smoke from the fires has been really bad. With warnings to stay inside. My plants uh, started flowering way late, but they looked ready to pull around 39 to 43 days of flower. This is unusual because uh, they normally go between 60 and 70 days. The trichomes were starting to turn cloudy, which is uh, usually my time to pull them. Do you think because of the reduction in light from the smoke that that played a role in flowering quicker? The light was significantly dimmer during the time. Uh, your thoughts would be greatly appreciated. So uh, what do you think there, Dan? Terrible situation out in California. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And the fires have just been devastating. Um, yeah, it, it is true that, like, if, if you know, it's that dim for weeks at a time, um, that that could affect the flowering schedule and your plants could flower quicker. I mean, you know, the plants understand that, like, if it starts starting to get dark early and it happens really quickly like that, they go into panic mode because their only mission is to make seeds and continue to live the next year. Um, so if they think that they're not going to flower in time, they will speed up that process. And that's what it sounds like has happened to you. Um, but again, you said you pull when the trichomes just start to turn cloudy. I would say, you know, give it a little extra time and let them m be cloudy and s just start to turn amber. Um, before you pull them but again uh you know it's unusual situation with the uh with the fires uh and like i said they can freak out and just start flowering quicker uh it'll it'll definitely affect your yield as well most likely you'll have a smaller yield because if the plant doesn't have those full 60 to 70 days uh even though that the, the gl gland heads will be mature uh there just won't be a lot of as much you know plant material or you know biomass Okay. So, uh, thank you, D-Man. Uh, sorry to hear you're dealing with those, uh, the fire situation out in California, but we hope that advice helps a little bit. Uh, we have time for one more. So let's go to IRA. And, uh, IRA writes that, um, the name is a dad joke, as in IRA Gardener. Uh, IRA. <laughs> yeah. IRA Gardener. IRA Gardener. Um, so that's better than, you know, Irish Republican Army or individual retirement account. Uh, IRA Gardner, he writes, uh, Good afternoon, Mike and Danny. I hope this email finds you well in these crazy corona times we live in. Uh, I live in a medical state, but it is only low THC oil. I'm just starting growing, and I have diagnosed a definite nutrient deficiency. I'm in soil in a tent with an LED panel. I have only a pH drop tester, and I'm using organic nutrients. I don't remember which kind. Blood meal and bone meal base 422. Anyhow, the nutrient solution tints the water when I mix it up. Can I use the drops test method uh, to test the pH of the nutrient solution after adding the nutrients? Also, can I use the same pH test kit to test the water runoff? 
uh, it comes through brownish as well. Well, that fuck up the reading as it starts out not clear. Um, I've read conflicting information online. I want to make sure that it's not a pH issue before adding more newts. Okay, so uh, what would you say to IRA? Yes, um, this is a good question. It's kind of a two-parter um, because you've diagnosed a deficiency, but you're also saying that it might be a pH issue. Um, the kit that you have to test the solution is the drip dripper kit, you know, the drop test kit that you can get um, for aquariums. It's not really ideal for cannabis growing. I mean, it'll give you a, a, a decent range. And even if the nutrient solution is kind of brownish, you know, if you get that into a little vial and you drop the dropper in there, you'll see what color everything turns to, especially if you put it in into the light, you know. Sh um, but it's, like I said, it's not ideal. It gives you basically a an idea, you know, a rough estimate of where your pH is. Because if, if it's light green, uh, then you're probably fine. If it's yellow uh, or red or blue, then you're in trouble. But again, these are very, very rough estimates. So I would honestly recommend getting yourself uh, a, a more efficient uh, pH test kit that also includes PPMs, which is parts per million. And in this way, um, you, you basically mix up your nutrient solution in your, in your barrel or your five gallon bucket or whatever you're using. Um, and then you can just dip these dipstick test kits into that. Uh, and it'll tell you the, the, the temperature of the nutrient solution, the parts per million of, uh, nutrient salts that are in there and the pH right down to like 0.01 in some cases. So, you know, invest in a actual dippable pH tester and that thing will tell you, you know, I mean, you can find these for a hundred bucks in between a hundred and two hundred dollars, uh, depending on, you know, the quality of, of the meter, but you get a digital pH, uh, PPM and temperature meter. You'll know exactly where your, uh, where your pH is and even also what your nutrient uh, situation looks like as well. Uh, well worth the money, definitely a lot better than the cheap uh, aquarium test kit that you're using now, and uh, will solve your problem. So try that. All right. So uh, uh, thank you, IRA. We hope that helps you out. Uh, and uh, thanks to everybody who wrote in. If you have a question that you'd like Dan to answer on the show, uh, drop us a line. Email is info at growbudyourself.com. Uh, what do you say we take a little break, then come back and wrap it up? Let's do it. All right, we are back, and I believe it is time to wrap up the show. Just want to say thank you to Dr. Mitch. Uh, thank you to Chanel Lindsay. Thanks to Excelsior Extracts. Check out their incredible THC-infused pain relief rub. Follow them on Instagram. Tell them Grow Bud Yourself and Danny sent you. Um, thanks to Vapor.com. Remember the code GBY uh, at Vapor.com gets you 15% 50, off of any products that they have there, including some amazing vaporizers, CBD products, uh, accessories, glass art, functional glass art, <laughs> and uh, all kinds of cool stuff. So check them out at Vapor.com. Use that code. Um, yeah. Exciting show. Uh, number 25. How are you feeling, Mike? I feel like that was a great show, but now any show that isn't uh, isn't interrupted uh, by surprise by Cheech Marin is a little bit of a letdown to me now. <laughs> yeah, we need to get him to do that uh, weekly on a weekly basis. That would be yeah. great. Yeah, <laughs> that was quite a surprise. Uh, but yeah, um, thanks you know to DJ Jacques and Winstrong. Um, thanks to you guys for listening, all the Patreon supporters. You guys are awesome. I actually got stickers and uh, some letterhead, so you will be getting your your uh, thank you notes from me and Mike in the very near future, and we really appreciate the support on there. Uh, please support us on Patreon. At the uh, $15 level, you get a free copy of my book signed and mailed right to your home. And... Uh, you know, there's all kinds of exclusive content on there for you guys to video. Yeah, if you a, bonus, see. Uh, a bonus Tommy Chong video is is coming up uh, very soon for the Patreon oh, awesome. people. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And if people want to see, you know, how the sausage is made, 
video of me and you and, and our guests. Um, there's a lot of exclusive video that uh, only our Patreon supporters get to see first. So uh, please support us there. That would be awesome. Uh, remember Vapor.com. Remember Excelsior Extracts. And uh, this is it. Episode number 25. Let's put it in the books. I always say this is like the worst show uh, to record police sirens going on in the background. <laughs> I mean, like... I always hated that, listening to like a rap record. Yeah. <laughs> car and you hear the siren. Yeah. Super paranoid.